You're listening to Past Imperfect, a history podcast brought to you by the Center for Wisdom and Leadership at SBJIMR. I'm Dinyar Patel. Sugar is one of the most ubiquitous ingredients in our diets. Delightful to taste, but quite commonplace and unextraordinary. Today, I'm joined by Ulba Bosma, who has written a world history about sugar, and the results might surprise you. The sweetness of sugar is mixed up with enormous power and some bitter truths. Tracing the origins of the global sugar industry to India and China, Bosma presents us with a new perspective on how capitalism developed. This is a story that unfolds largely in Asia, and it is enabled by some incredible examples of early globalization. It is also a story of great tragedy and brutality. Bosma asks us to consider how humanity's collective sweet tooth has ushered in oppressive labor regimes, ecological disasters, and a litany of modern day health problems. Ulba, thank you very much for joining us today on our, on our podcast episode. Uh, it's a delight to have read your, your book, The World of Sugar. Um, and like many other people who um, have studied elements of the history of capitalism, my, my first introduction to the history of sugar particularly was Sidney Mintz's book from 1985, Sweetness and Power. And I thought of the title of that book quite often uh, while reading your book, uh, because it's quite stunning how sugar has translated over history uh, into political power, uh, whether it is the, the Dutch East India Company uh, or the Gladstone family in 19th century Britain, uh, American sugar barons in the kingdom of Hawaii, or even the Aquinos in, in the Philippines. I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, to begin this podcast, how can we explain the unique political potency of sugar? Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. Um, I think it already starts in the 13th, 14th century when sugar was still a very precious item. Um, its weight was measured in gold. Um, and so for rulers, for caliphs and sultans, it was a, an item um, that was of great interest to them. So uh, furthering sugar production and trade was a, a way of enhancing their uh, revenue. Um, and that is something which we see from the 13th, 14th century onwards, that the states, that rulers are never far away when it concerns uh, sugar. Um, so that, that continues from the, the, the caliphs and the emperors and the sultans to uh, the, the kings and, uh, of the Portugal and Spain, to the Dutch East India Company, as you said, and then in the 19th century, also, the state is very much involved in setting tariffs, in setting the conditions for sugar production and, and consumption. And that has not changed uh, until this very day. So I've, I find it quite appropriate that you've titled your book The World of Sugar, because the story that you, you give us is very much a, a deep and very complex history of, of global and transnational links. Uh, you've given us, again, some incredible examples from, from your book uh, of how uh, people involved in the sugar trade, whether, they're, whether they are the laborers or whether they are the sugar planters or individuals involved in, in spreading the taste, a taste for sugar in different parts of the world, uh, were consummate border hoppers. What has made sugar such an intrinsically global commodity? I think that uh, it was already a, a very global commodity in the 6th and 7th century when uh, large uh, parts of Bengal uh, produced sugar, when it, it was exported to China, when it exported to sugar production and manufacturing to uh, to Persia and further uh, into uh, to even in, as far as Egypt. So um, for a very long time, Eurasia, so to speak, was involved in sugar consumption and uh, production. And much of Eurasia, it was just a, a peasant sugar. It was part of the agricultural cycle. It was part of almost part of everyday uh, consumption. Um, so there was already a lot of sugar uh, production and trade in Asia even before uh, it came to, to Western Europe. I think Western Europe was a, a relatively a latecomer in the world of, uh, of sugar. So it was there from the very beginning and was a an, key element in the emergence of capitalism in, uh, in Asia. And I think it's very important to, to realize ourselves 
that the, the, the center of gravity of sugar production and consumption was in Asia, not in Europe. Amongst the, the various stories that you present in your book of these, these global links, was, was there any story in partic- particular that stood out to you as your favorite example of just how transnational a commodity sugar has been? There's a, there's a remarkable story about a Cuban sugar family, sugar tycoon, tycoons, who came from Spain originally, who still uh, are living now today in uh, Florida, where they're the owners of the largest sugar enterprise in the world. Um, they are now having uh, factories um, in, I think, more than 20 countries in the world. Um, they still have Spanish passports alongside their American passports, I assume. Um, they are still very much um, focused on sugar production on a global uh, market. So I think that after um, the uh, the Cuban Revolution, uh, that was um, that was under Fidel Castro, which forced them out of Cuba. They started again in Florida, and they built again their their worldwide world spanning um, network of of sugar enterprises. So I think this is a, a clear case of how families, in fact, embodied this traditional character of uh, of sugar. So we have people who have now crossed in in one and a half century three countries: Spain, Cuba, and the United States. So I'll I'll read out something from the beginning of your book. Uh, This is something that you say in in your introduction, quote, in the mid-19th century, sugar was what oil would become in the 20th, the global South's most valuable export commodity, end quote. We've now had quite a bit of scholarship uh, that's been generated on the history of commodities, everything from oil to to cotton. Uh, What can sugar tell us about global capitalism that is different from, say, what we could learn from the study of these other commodities? I think a very important part is how it relates to our own bodies. It's about the consumption uh, patterns. It's uh, really everywhere. Take up a packaged item from your shelves and you will find sugar in it. And that's not just in the United States or in Europe, but I think it's in most countries of the world. So that's, I think, what makes sugar really a global commodity. The next a point is that sugar is now produced in about almost 130 countries in the world. Uh, so it's a really a global commodity in terms of production and of consumption. Um, I think that's that's something which sugar makes very special, I think. And indeed, the third element is uh, the geopolitical character, which it shares with oil. Um, Sugar was a a reason for wars, a reason for high tariff wars, for trade wars, and so on and so forth. So this is really something which makes sugar a a kind of of global commodity uh, that is unmatched by any other commodities, apart from oil, I think, for the 20th century. So as you've noted, the very beginnings of the world of sugar lie in in Asia, uh, in India, and a little later in China. And you make a very significant intervention, I think, over here by arguing that the pre-modern sugar eco- economies in places like India uh, bore many of the hallmarks of capitalism. How does sugar capitalism in places like India and China change our understandings of how modern global capitalism developed? Yeah, that's a very important question. I think that if we, defi- we, we have to go back to the definition of capitalism, I think. I have a very broad definition of capitalism, which is uh, exchange for profit. So as soon as money comes in and exchange for profit comes in, then I see some, well, some, some pockets of capitalism emerging. Um, and of course, these pockets of capitalism spread out of, over time and encapsulate more and more aspects of our lives. So we can say that capitalism is already there in the 12th or the 13th century, um, but not, of course, this, to the same extent as it is there today. Um, but what we can see in the Indian countryside is that farmers uh, produce a kind of coarse, raw sugar. It still exists today, of course, very beloved in India, the gur. We all know about that. Um, and this gore is being bought by uh, refineries in the in the cities. They go into the countryside, they buy sugar, they process uh, coarse sugar into a white crystalline sugar, and they sell this white crystalline sugar. Um, and from the 13th, 14th century onwards, over uh, even uh, ever larger uh, distances. So this is what we see, the beginnings of capitalism. At the time that um, Ibn Battuta and Marco Polo, the, the two famous uh, travelers, visited uh, India and China respectively, they already saw a, a flourishing trade in uh, sugar. So that gave me the, um, the, the motivation to speak about capitalism in Asia 
perhaps in a way antedating capitalism in in Europe, although not by far, of course. You see what what's usually called Middle Ages in Europe, which is but let's say between 1000 and 1500 after Christ, we already see in Eurasia a flourishing uh, capitalism, a budding capitalism, it's better to say that, a budding capitalism emerge. Um, so this is a very important point. As sugar, sugar is a key element in this budding capitalism. Yeah, it, it's interesting in, in, in the sense that, you know, when I was reading your book, I was thinking of other connections that are being made in this era. I mean, say like the Silk, the Silk Road, for example, right? And, you know, a book had come out recently um, by Maria Favreau, where she was talking about how the Silk Road really tied together the, the economies of uh, places like China and Eastern Europe and the, the Baltic states uh, in a way that, you know, preceded globalism, uh, at least modern globalism, by hundreds of years. And in some ways, your book is, is making a similar argument. You're, you're pointing to Eurasian uh, you know, origins for, for capitalism in an era that's, you know, several hundred years before what we commonly define as the creation of modern capitalism in Western Europe. Absolutely true. And I think we have to, we, we come to reconsider this whole history of, of intense relationship between what the world, well, let's say, stretching from Cairo to, um, to Beijing um, and both over land with the caravan trade as well as over sea. Um, and this is what, what I would call Eurasia, to which uh, Western Europe was just the kind of appendix. It was just a kind of peripheral part of a world which already existed um, uh, well before Columbus crossed the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And in this respect, also this history of sugar is also an attempt to decenter uh, Europe in a way. So aside from India and China, the, the other Asian sugar power that really dominates a lot of your narrative is the Dutch Empire. Uh, through Taiwan, uh, and of course, most, significant, most significantly in, in Java. And you note that by the late 19th century, Java had emerged as an exporting powerhouse uh, for the Asian markets uh, and a global center for, uh, for sugarcane research. What explained the success of the Dutch Empire in Java, uh, especially in comparison with uh, the, the somewhat lackluster performance of uh, the sugar economy in, in India? under the British Empire at around the same time? Well, the, the British tried to industrialize sugar production in India, um, and they simply um, encountered a, an existing economy, um, and they were not able to compete with the existing sugar economy in India. They did not have the networks to enter the Indian countryside. They could not oblige uh, and compel Indian farmers to produce cane for their factories. And this is the difference with Java, where there was already a system of forced labor in place from the, inherited from the, the Dutch East India Company. And this forced labor system was extended in the, uh, from 1830 onwards um, under the so-called uh, forced cultivation system, which compelled farmers to produce cane for factories that were owned by Europeans and that were equipped with the most advanced uh, processing uh, uh, machines. So the, the, the steam driven cane crushers, but also the vacuum pans that could boil uh, sugar within a couple of hours into something which is uh, the juice in a couple of hours in, into crystalline sugar. So this is what's, what really uh, made up the difference between India and, uh, and Java. The next stage of its success was that it, that was also a matter of finding alternatives for a European market that became increasingly uh, inaccessible because of uh, Europe had its own sugar, its beet sugar, which is heavily protected. The American market became closed as well. America relied on its own beet sugar industry and the Cuban sugar industry. So Java had to find alternative markets and it found them among the growing urban classes in Japan, in China, and also in in India. So this is what what happened with Java. Java was was a producer by the 19th, late nineteenth century and the early twentieth century for for Asia, not for Europe and the United States. You had mentioned the forced cultivation system that was present in Java. Could you tell us a little bit more about how it worked and why it was developed in the first place? Initially, after the Napoleonic Wars and after the abolition of the slave trade by British Parliament in 1807, the whole idea of forced labor, of slavery, was not very popular among uh, European uh, politicians. But they had expected that, that slavery would disappear and that um, in the West Indies and Brazil um, and Cuba, 
uh, that free labor would become the norm. That did not happen. So that was a problem for, for Java, which was far away from Europe. Ships still had to round the, the Cape Good Hope. Uh, so they were under, for three months uh, underway, and during the three months, a lot of sugar perished because it rotted away. So the, Java had a serious, serious disadvantage uh, compared to the um, the sugar producing um, uh, regions in in the Americas. The only way to solve that and to attract capital to build a sugar industry was to uh, impose upon the the peasantry of Java a system which co um, uh, compelled them to uh, produce cane for uh, European sugar factories that were also subsidized by the colonial government. And because, and that's an interesting point, this which we have to realize is for the 19th century, the wage level, the, the, the standard of living in Asia was much lower than in, in the Americas. So that was the way in which uh, Java could compete with sugar in, in, in the Americas. Uh, the, the, the sugar in, in India, by the way, was also perfectly competitive. Uh, tens of thousands of tons of Indian sugar still reached uh, British households in the 1870s. So Asian sugar was healthily competitive on the global market for most of the 19th century. Yeah, and I find it remarkable that people in India were observing what was going on in Java and actually uh, talking about it in, in, rel in a relatively positive light. I mean, someone like Mahadev Govind Ranade, the, the Indian economic thinker, actually wrote about the forced cultivation system in Java in the 1890s uh, and suggested that something similar might be tried out here in India in order to to stimulate the, the the creation of capital and therefore industrialization. Well, it was it was in, in, introduced with some optimism that uh, indeed it, it was a forced cultivation in the beginning. But the idea was that after a while, Japanese peasants would see their interest because it was forced cultivation, but it was not unpaid cultivation. So they got a wage, they got a payment for for the cane they delivered, and it was hoped that at a certain stage that it would uh, this the, the monetar monetization of the Japanese rural economy would create a capitalist economy in Java, would uh, enhance the level of, of production and consumption, and the Japanese would thus become a homo economic. I mean, that's, that's the whole idea. Um, in practice, it went along with a lot of resistance, um, violence, uh, even famines. So the general, uh, the general uh, judgment of the uh, forced cultivation system is negative. So there would not be any serious Dutch historian who would say that uh, the cultivation system was a blessing for uh, the people of Java. It was a blessing for the Dutch economy. I mean, the Dutch gained a lot uh, by it. And still today, most of the railways that had been constructed in the Netherlands had been uh, paid by money uh, <laughs> that has been worked together with by uh, Japanese uh, peasants. So that's, that's the, the idea. It was really an exploitation system. It was colonial exploitation. So the, the other system, of course, of exploitation that really stands out in your book is, is the system of slavery in, in the West Indies. And, you know, from, from reading Sidney Mintz's Sweetness and Power many years ago, you know, the, the, the certain images that he describes in the book uh, that really stand out in your mind. I mean, how sugar plantation workers and in the West Indies were so overworked that oftentimes they died in the most horrible of ways from exhaustion, you know, their limbs being cut off or simply collapsing into boiled vats of, uh, boiling vats of sugar. Um, and you describe many other horrific examples in your book that perpetuates this idea of just how terrible life was for uh, enslaved workers on sugar plantations. How precisely was the work of sugar plantations just so much more brutal and awful uh, than, say, uh, work on cotton or tobacco plantations uh, on neighboring islands or in the vicinity in the West Indies? Well, as Sidney Min said, the, the, during the harvest, and that's something we need to need to know, um, sh cane, sugar cane perishes within 48 hours. So the harvest time is a couple of months per year. Um, and everything has to be harvested in in, uh, in in a rush. It has to be brought to the mills, and there it has to be milled as soon as possible. So you can't c keep cane waiting for days. That meant that people working in the mills had to work for about 18 hours per, per day. And uh, the same goes for the, for the people who cut the cane in the field. 
the conditions in the in the in the mills were horrible, uh, hot. It was terrible, hard working and and long days. Um, so people suffered. Um, in the fields, we had the the risks of the the animals that were in the fields, the rats, the snakes. Uh, people were walking there in the fields, barefooted, in in the middle of these these sharp uh, uh, canes. Um, they had to bring manure to the fields, uh, which also caused many diseases. Um, there was a zone in the, in the Caribbean uh, that was constantly in, in uh, engaged in warfare. So there were permanently wars in the 17th and 18th century. And these wars uh, obstructed or could obstruct the uh, supplies of food, uh, which caused famines. Um, so there are a lot of, of, of causes that made the uh, sugar plantations, particularly in the West Indies, far more deadly than, for example, uh, let's say tobacco and rice plantations in, in New England. So, uh, yeah, this is a sharp difference. Whereas in, in the United States, in the 18th century, the enslaved populations uh, um, increased. Uh, there was a natural growth there. Um, in the West Indies, the slave population decreased by 6% per year. If, if not, um, they were uh, replenished with constant supplies of kidnapped uh, Africans. If I recall correctly, you, you mentioned that mortality rates in some places could be as high as 33% one year after arrival. That's absolutely true because that has also to do with the acclimat acclimatization uh, with respect to new diseases, uh, smallpox, you, you, you name them. Uh, so uh, many people died uh, just a year or one, two years after arrival. Um, and But then the people who survived uh, usually did not uh, live very long either. I mean, after eight or ten years, they were completely uh, their bodies were demolished by the conditions of the um, of the plantations. So the cane fields were really killing fields. Sugar became the main target of the abolitionist movement from the late 18th century onward, um, a movement that's been popularly celebrated for the supposed triumph of you know popular morality over capitalist greed when British consumers chose to lead mass boycotts, many of them led by men uh, by women against slave produced sugar. Uh, but in my mind, one of the most shocking episodes you describe in your book is how not long after the abolitionist, abolitionist movement led to the passing of legislation in 1834, which uh, banned slavery uh, in the British Empire, uh, Great Britain quietly began resuming mass imports of sugar from places like Brazil and Cuba, where slaves were still growing uh, sugar. What explains this about face? And how has this episode largely been untalked about in, in terms of historic scholarship on the abolitionist movement? Well, the, the problem was, uh, it, it was a domestic problem of, of Britain. Uh, Britain at the time, the 1830s, 1840s, was rapidly urbanizing, was rapidly industrializing. So it, it, it coped with a growing proletariat, and this proletariat became unruly. It's, uh, it, it had hunger, it was uh, impoverished, and um, the there was a, a need for Britain to lower the tariffs on the imports of food. Um, and it was not just sugar, but it was also other food stuff. So the whole idea was we are an industrial nation, so we need to uh, bring in the primary uh, goods, the, the, the food, as cheaply as possible to feed the proletarians and in, in order to allow uh, employers to keep the wages low. So if you have a cheap food, you allow the, the employers to reduce their, their wages or to keep their wages at a low level. So that was one of the reasons that um, after uh, initially banning the import of uh, slave-based uh, sugar in 1834, exactly in the year that um, the, uh, the, 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 the slavery was, was banned in uh, the British Empire, that uh, sugar prices rose in Britain. So uh, in the 1840s, um, the, the optimism that uh, sugar from non-slave uh, producing regions, and India was a particularly important uh, region, that these regions could replace the uh, slave-based uh, sugar from, for example, Cuba and, and, uh, and Brazil, did not come true. So there was a discussion in Parliament and uh, there was a lobby to allow uh, the sugar from Brazil and Cuba in, but on the condition uh, 
that these two countries would make a serious efforts to um, to stop the um, the uh, uh, the import of uh, of enslaved workers from uh, from Africa. So it was a kind of compromise. It was also a yes, I think a a, a wake up call. The initial optimism um, in the wake of the um, the abolition of the slave trade in 1807, the initial optimism had waned. It was not possible to produce uh, cheap sugar for the British market without uh, slavery. And this is happening around the same time that Cobden and others are, are leading the, the anti-corn law uh, league when there's a general movement for, as you as you mentioned, cheaper commodities for, for the workers in, in Great Britain. So, I mean, is it a, a stretch to say that you, you have a progressive moment where, you know, the anti-corn law league is discussing uh, the need for cheaper foodstuffs uh, having an effect on perpetuating a system of slavery uh, in terms of Britain's... Definitely, yes. Of course, uh, Cobden and, and his people also sought for other uh, ways to uh, procure sugar. So he also sponsored uh, indirectly sugar production in the Philippines at the island of Negros. Uh, so it was not their first... It was not their... their uh, most preferred solution to go to Brazil and and Cuba. But the idea that was initially there at the time of Adam Smith, that free trade and free labor would go together, that these two things belong together, uh, that optimism had gone by the 1840s. And you had mentioned how India was thought to be kind of symbolic of this idea, right? That you could get relatively free labor to do um, the work that you know was otherwise being done by by slaves in India, and it could be cheaper and be more moral, uh, but it doesn't work out as you, as you mentioned. The the Indian sugar economy keeps keeps to keeps on kind of sputtering along, and and attempts to industrialize in the eighteen thirties and eighteen forties don't really lead to much. What what precisely happened over here? As a combination of factors, uh, as I explained before, um, in Java, the colonial government and, and the Japanese nobility were able to impose on the Japanese peasants what they had to produce. That was perfectly impossible in uh, Bengal. Even um, the, uh, the, the, the great uh, Tagore was the great grandfather of the, the famous poet. He was a zamindar. He had a lot of land. He had a lot of capital. He built sugar factories. So it was an Indian person who built already sugar factories in the 1830s. But he was not able to impose upon the, the peasantry on his land to say, okay, you have to, to grow uh, sugar cane and you have to bring it to the or cane, yeah, sugar cane and you have to bring it to my factories. That was impossible. There was only one part in India where this was possible that was in the, in the North India and Bihar that uh, almost against the border of Nepal. There you had uh, landed uh, uh, conditions that allowed the rulers to impose on the peasantry what they had to uh, produce. And here you see the European uh, industrialists coming in. They became the land leases of these rajas and they could impose upon the, 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 the peasantry uh, to grow cane for them. But they had another problem. They had to uh, carry the, the cane, the sugar, thousands of miles along the river Ganges. Um, and at the time that the, the stuff reached Calcutta, uh, most of it was perished, so it was rotten away. So they were a little bit too early because 10 years, 15 years later, there were railroads, and they, these could have carried uh, sugar easily to the port of Calcutta. Um, so this is a kind of, well, it's, it's, it's a very specific situation. Um, if things had been a diff little different, uh, India would have become a very successful industrial sugar producer already by the mid-19th century. It didn't happen. So in your book, you, you talk about how in many places, uh, sugar was an industry where one brutal system of, of labor was replaced by another that was pretty much almost as brutal, right? I mean, so after slavery is is outlawed in places like the United States or eventually Brazil or, or other parts of uh, the sugar-producing um, uh, uh, regions of the world, uh, the, the systems of labor that are, are used to replace it are, are not really much, much better. From the perspective of laborers, how is global sugar a story of resistance? Uh, not just resistance to exploitative labor conditions, but to capitalism itself. There are two sides here. Uh, on the one hand is the, the, the role of, of labor. On the other hand is the, the, the politics of the employers. Um, after the abolition of slavery, employers tried to procure labor as cheaply as possible. There were different mechanisms which they employed. Force was one of them. 
So uh, as soon as slavery was abolished in the West Indies and in the French Antilles, you see all kinds of vagrancy laws uh, being um, enacted to force people who did not have work, uh, according to uh, the colonial authorities, of course, to force them back into their plantations. That was one thing. The next thing was to uh, uh, send out ships to India, uh, to China, to uh, hire uh, labor there, to contract uh, labor. Um, so these labors were brought to, uh, to Cuba, to Peru, to uh, the United States even, to, of course, the West Indies, to Natal in, uh, in South Africa. Um, and this, this, these labor forces uh, were also kept in place by a kind of divide and rule system. So, uh, for example, what we see in uh, Hawaii, uh, Hawaii was an important sugar producing archipelago of the United States in the middle of the Pacific. Um, first, they, they brought in uh, Chinese uh, laborers. Um, that's a certain stage that had to be phased out because the United States in 1882 decided no longer any Chinese labor has to come in in our country. Then uh, Japanese labor was uh, tried. The Japanese resisted their the labor conditions fiercely. Then they decided, okay, let's bring up, uh, bring in the Filipino uh, labors and so on and so forth. So the whole idea was that they very well know that the conditions under which these laborers had to work, the, that we talk and hear about the indentured labor, so they were forced to come under contract, which did not allow them to leave the plantations until their contract was expired. So this is what we call indentured uh, labor. So this is a, a form of forced labor uh, under conditions uh, where the wages were set by the employers. There was no negotiation whatsoever about the height of the of the of the of the wages, and uh, of course the, the the labors came from far. The housing conditions were often uh, deplorable, but there was not much which you could do against it because they were not allowed to strike. So here we have this kind of of fierce struggles between the indentured labors. And the uh, and the employers on the on the other hand, uh, there was throughout the cane um, producing uh, world and even uh, stretching into the beet sugar producing regions as well in the in the more temperate zones of this uh, this world. So this led to terrible situations in Natal uh, that is uh, has also have been described also by uh, the historians from India, but also terrible conditions at the plantations in Suriname. Uh, that have been described by Dutch uh, historians, um, where uh, labor protest um, could lead to violent, um, violent uh, uh, reactions by the uh, authorities, even to killings and casualties. Um, so this is a, a another black page in the history of uh, of sugar. India seemed to be one of those places where uh, industrial capitalism, at least, was resisted. Uh, quite strongly by a lot of farmers, uh, you know, a, a preference for making their own sugar, sticking to good rather than industrial sugar. Uh, why was um, capitalism, or industrial capitalism, I should say, rather resisted so strongly in India? I think that this has everything to do with the fact that that Gore was a an article that is so beloved among Indian consumers. So whatever the the capitalist tried, industrialist tried to do, if they did not pay enough for the cane. Um, the farmers would say, okay, we, we process our own cane and we uh, produce our gore and we can easily sell it. So it was not just that, that uh, farmers were capable of, of, of making gore and then having it, well, selling it into their own, uh, let's say, village environment. No, there were even long distance trading networks of gore in, in India. So there was a gore economy that already existed and um, which produced a a, an item that was there was demand for it, and there was not only was demand for it, there is demand for it until this very day, and until this very day, you see that 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 farmers have the option either to deliver the cane to the factories or produce cool. And what we see in the 20th century is that in some cases, even if peasants were offered more for their cane than for their gore. Uh, they might might prefer to produce gore. This is just to stay independent. So farmers very well know uh, about power and uh, 
about autonomy. Absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, any anyone who knows the, the Indian sweet scene quite well can attest to the fact that, that gur can oftentimes be much more tasty than, than normal sugar. So I can understand yes. the, the continuing yeah. appeal of it. Yeah. yeah. So from from systems of, of slavery and, you know, terrible labor regimes, I want to uh, turn a little bit uh, to innovation, uh, the more innovative side of, of the sugar economy. Um, and you write in your book the following. The sugar industry represents two facets of capitalism, progressive and innovative on the one hand, but also indifferent to social and ecological consequences so long as these do not harm business, end quote. Uh, but at the same time, you also talk about in your book how sugar could at times be very non-innovative. Uh, it relied on intensely uh, intense uh, labor regimes. Uh, it, it was a, a field where mechanization did not really happen uh, until after World War II. Uh, so how did innovation and lack of innovation kind of fit together uh, in global sugar? For that, we have to realize that sugar is an agro-industrial product. So it has a kind of a centaur. It's, it's on the one hand, it's, it's an agricultural product, and that's the field. On the other hand, we have to factory the processing of the cane into this white uh, crystalline uh, sugar. Now, in the from the... the beginning of the 19th century, we see steam and steel coming into these factories. So the, the cane crushes become mechanized, become driven by, by steam. Uh, in the early 19th century, already hundreds of steam-driven cane crushes across the, across the world, including India, by the way. Um, so, and, and then came the boiling process was also um, um, uh, attended by steam and, st and steel. We have the vacuum pans which boils the, the juice just below 100 degrees, which prevents uh, the, the juice from scorching. Um, you have this rapid uh, development of the sugar factory as a kind of integrated uh, processing uh, unit, which is also... Uh, highly uniform throughout the world. So whether you have a sugar factory in India in the early 20th century or in Louisiana or in Java or in Natal, they all look the same. And they even look a bit the same as the, the, the beet sugar factories. So what we see is that industrialization in uh, the factories is rapidly advancing. On the other hand, you have the fields uh, with very different social conditions, very difficult uh, different uh, supplies of labor. In Cuba, for example, there was a permanent uh, shortage of labor. In Java, there was an abundance of labor. So that led to very different situations in the field. Java sugar production was extremely labor intensive. In Cuba, it was uh, labor extensive. Um, then the, the, the problem of mechanization, the word attempts were made already in the 19th century to build a mechanical cane harvest. But you, as you can imagine, cane is not wheat. I mean, it's so, so much more stubborn. It's so much more higher. It's so much more complicated to build um, uh, me mechanized uh, cane harvests that only after the Second World War, these, uh, these machines became more uh, general. And also the soil conditions were very different. So if you, you put a cane harvester in, in the, the wetlands of uh, Florida, they simply sucked into the, in the soil. Uh, so this is also, these cane harvests had to be adapted to local uh, ecological uh, circumstances. The result is, of course, that throughout the 19th century and in the early 20th century, uh, labor was in short supply in the cane fields. So the cane fields really had to fight for their, their labor. And when once the labor was there, uh, of course, the, the employers tried to keep labor there. And that's the reason, also one of the reasons when slave, while slavery and indentured labor and forced labor became a key feature of, of the world's uh, cane fields. Sugar seems a, a very important commodity in order to understand how the Industrial Revolution developed globally. Uh, but at the same time, you describe how it also is important in terms of understanding a certain form of managerial revolution. You talk about um, the role of um, experts, managers, uh, scientists on the fields of, of, of uh, sugar growing areas, as well as the development of these uh, experimental stations in everywhere from Java to India to other parts of the world. 
Sugar had to be produced in, in even larger quantities because there was a lot of demand for it. But the demand was dependent upon its price. So in order to become a bulk article, it had to become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Production uh, uh, systems had to become more and more efficient. So uh, in order to earn more money in a market which saw permanently declining prices, uh, the employers had to invent ways to produce more and more sugar against the lower price. So cost effectiveness became, became a very important uh, item. That's one thing. The other thing is that um, the quest for um, finding the best canes had led since the uh, 18th century to kind of monoculture. So in, in the world, there were only a few varieties of cane that were used, apart again from, from India, which had motley collections of cane in the field. That was in the way what was not very efficient, but it made cane production in India less vulnerable than it was, for example, in Cuba or Java or the West Indies. So what happened? In the quest for efficiency and more profits, um, a monoculture, a monocultivation, uh, a lack of, of, of genetic diversity led to diseases when they emerged, they within a few decades they were all over the place in the world so that created really havoc uh, so after a series of diseases uh, employers decided to uh, to uh, establish experimental stations to uh, to grow and to breed cane varieties that would be resistant against diseases and over the course of this process they found canes that were ever ever more high yielding. So the green revolution, which we know from rice from the 1950s, 1960s, was already there in the early 20th century with respect to uh, to cane. And of course, aside from cane, as you describe in the book, people were constantly searching for other sources for, for sugar. And the big innovation yeah. you describe in the book, of course, is, is uh, beet sugar, uh, discovered just before yeah. the, the Napoleonic Wars. Can, can you take us through precisely how uh, beet sugar uh, was discovered and, and how it revolutionized uh, the global sugar landscape. Yeah, during the Napoleonic Wars, it need, needs a bit of, uh, of historical context. <clears throat> Napoleon, in his fight with uh, Britain, decided in 1806 to blockade all imports of, of British goods into continental Europe. And that was there for that reason, it's called the continental system. So that continental system stretched from Russia to France to Spain. So that was a way of well, Napoleon thought that he could that that way squash uh, British economic superiority. It did not work out entirely. So there was one problem that Britain at that time owed much most of the sugar uh, production uh, islands in producing islands in the Caribbean. Uh, so there was a severe shortage of sugar in uh, in Europe. And precisely in these years, there was a German uh, gentleman, Franz Karl Achar, who was an inventor by profession, um, who was a pupil uh, trained by a pharmacist. Uh, this pharmacist had, had invented some methods to uh, extract sucrose from beetroots. And, and that's, that's quite a miracle because beetroots do not very, look very sweet and, and juicy. I mean, this is a kind of stubborn stuff. Um, uh, and um, this Ashar in 2000, sorry, in 1811, had discovered a way to uh, produce uh, sugar from this beetroots on a commercial basis. In fact, what was going on in Europe was a kind of race to find uh, all kinds of material, um, organic material from which sucrose could be extracted. So there were people working on, on grapes, and grapes looked to be more promising than, uh, than beetroots in the beginning. Uh, potatoes, uh, mushrooms, everything, uh, in incredible even. Uh, there were these this maple trees. Uh, maple trees were grown and um, imported, but uh, that didn't work either in Europe. So eventually it was in, in 1811, the, the, the Académie Française, the, the, the scientific committee of France, decided that it should be um, it should be the beetroot. So Napoleon decided to um, to start a school for the beet sugar industry, to uh, designate a, a huge acreage to the production of um, of beetroots, the, the cultivation of beetroots. Um, and meanwhile, spontaneously all over Europe, about 150 sugar factories uh, sprang up. So it was a kind of revolutionary movement. Uh, 
It was also considered to be revolutionary because it was also believed to put an end to the system of slavery and slave based uh, sugar production. So there was a hope and and not not, not the least with the, uh, the the inventor of the commercial production of beet uh, sugar, uh, Ashar, who wrote at the end of his long book that he hoped that this his invention would put an end to slavery and colonialism. And of course, he was a, a German and Germany did, did not have uh, colonies or uh, and slave plantations. So uh, yeah, there was a hope that the world would have a substitute which would be more human than cane sugar. And even attempts were made in the United States to follow on this course and to produce beet sugar as well. Unfortunately, uh, the beet sugar um, is growing in a more temperate climate and the, the beetroots have more difficulty in absorbing uh, and, and uh, uh, converting solar energy into, uh, into sucrose. Um, so beet sugar was more expensive than cane sugar. After Napoleon lost the, the war in Waterloo, uh, you see a collapse of the beet sugar factories industry in, in Europe. So from beet sugar, I want to bring us to the, the contemporary moment. Uh, when we think about global sugar today, uh, the picture that you paint for us can be quite grim. Uh, you talk about chronic overproduction through new sources of, 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 of sweeteners such as high fructose corn syrup and everything from Splenda to, to new products that are being put uh, on the market, uh, a chronic inability to, to regulate and coordinate national production, um, and a very powerful sugar lobby, which is compared in terms of its influence in, in your book uh, to things like the National Rifle Association in the United States. Um, and you write that today, national governments spend as much as $50 billion annually uh, in order to subsidize the global sugar industry. What, if anything, is, is the way that we get out of this current malaise? I think we get back to the, the first point we raised uh, at the beginning of this uh, the talk. Um, the state is never far away from sugar production. And as you said, the state is subsidizing sugar production. Uh, that could be done directly or indirectly via protectionist structures or tariff structures, uh, which make sugar for domestic consumption more expensive. Um, so the state is there. Um, and I think we have to understand that the state can also um, mitigate the consequences of overproduction or uh, make serious effort to implement the guideline that has been uh, issued by the World Health Organization already in the 1990s, I believe, that uh, per capita sugar production uh, consumption per year should be limited to about uh, 20 kilos. Now, look at the United States. It's more about... In, in, in the order of 16 kilos, in Europe it's 40 kilos, but also in India or in Mexico or many other countries in the world, sugar consumption is simply too high to be healthy. Governments can do something about it to say, okay, we, we need to implement the guidelines of the, uh, of the World Health Organization. But the, 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 the governments are facing a well-organized sugar uh, lobby, and that's in, in almost every country whether it's India or whether it's United States or whether it's in Europe. So this, this, this requires an amount of political will um, that this, 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 and, and also the, the recognition that overconsumption of sugar is not a question of, of an individual who is consuming too much sugar. It's not an individual health problem, but it's a political problem. And it has to be addressed as a political problem. And then it has to go to the parliaments and parliaments have to decide and then to say, okay, we need to enact laws that limit sugar consumption, as happened, for example, in, in Europe with respect to, to salt and in some countries indeed in the world already with respect to sugar. So this is the case with uh, Mexico, for example, where the situation was really horrific, where, where because of a lack of dr uh, clean drinking water, uh, children uh, got Coca-Cola for breakfast instead of water. Well, that's not a very healthy thing, of course. Uh, I have nothing against Coca-Cola, but uh, all, everything with measure. So this is something which we can decide on. It's a political uh, problem. And that's what I try to do and try to emphasize in this book, that the state and the politics are never far, far away. Sugar is not uh, just a product of a free enterprise and a free market. No, no, no. There's always the government it's, that's there. 
And of course, you have societies like America, where even though the, the clean uh, drink, drinking water exists, people still have Pepsi and Coke for, for breakfast. Yeah. So it's not just, not just societies like Mexico. Um, towards the end of your book, <clears throat> you discuss about how uh, prospects like the free trade movement, uh, movements for green capitalism or responsible capitalism could perhaps uh, provide us with a guiding light to get uh, sugar, global sugar to um, behave more ethically. Um, given that sugar is such a, a global behemoth, and given that it's, it's produced in so many places and that it's consumed everywhere, uh, what can the average consumer do to help uh, improve the situation for, say, uh, both the laborers uh, who work in the global sugar in- industry and also to you know, combat against this, this, this problem of overproduction and overconsumption that you talk about? What a consumer can do is of limited um, importance, I think. Uh, we can, of course, buy a fair trade sugar. It's there. It's it's only a minute, less than a percent. I think it's a fifth of a percent of the global sugar market. But we can do that. And I think we should do that. Um, so there are now big uh, corporations like Tate and Lyle who, who bring a fair trade sugar on the market, which is produced in, in Belize, I, I believe. Um, and that is produced by farmers cooperatives. And they get a little bit more money than other uh, farmers who are just outrightly uh, exploited. So that's a good thing. Um, and at the same time, of course, uh, this sugar can produ- be produced under ecologically uh, responsible uh, circumstances. This sugar, of course, may be a bit more expensive, but I think most, most consumers can, can afford that. It's not that, that much of a trouble. But then, most of our sugar, of our sweetness, is not going... And in the, the, the packages of sugar which we buy in the in the in the in the, in the, in the supermarket or wherever, uh, but it comes into our sugar uh, in our food to the food industry, and there's little control of that. So that makes it very difficult. If we have a, a packaged food, it might consist of dozens of of ingredients. A sugar is just one of them, an important one, but just one of them. How to control this, I don't know. I think I don't think that the consumers can really affect this. On the other hand, I think that uh, producers um, are aware of, of, of consumer criticism. Um, if I have visited a couple of websites of large sugar producers in the world. They all say that they, they are aiming to produce sugar under ecologically and socially responsible conditions. So we have, can keep them to their word. Uh, but it's a long struggle. I, I don't say that we should not uh, try it, but and we should. But it's it's a long struggle. It's not that easy. Especially since in, in your book, in, in in some ways, you describe the tactics of the global sugar industry as being quite similar to say the tobacco industry. Uh, of course, the, the the sugar industry will not not uh, uh, say that uh, uh, consuming sixty kilos of sugar per year uh, is, is healthy for uh, for a consumer. But what they will say, do is try to sow as much confusion about the whole issue as, as possible. That's what happens. Or deflect the attention of, of the public. So when in the 1950s there was some concern about sugar consumption, um, there was also concern about fat as a cause of cardiovascular diseases. Uh, there was research going on in Harvard uh, on the, uh, the, the, cause, the, the role of fat in um, cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. And one of the sponsors was the sugar industry. And just to deflect the attention from sugar to fat. And that has helped because that was still the case in the 1980s. Fat was, was the demon and sugar was quite innocent. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is that um, we have the beverage industry. And beverages are not, not advertised as food. They are not a, a currency. Uh, for the, in the food industry, they are considered to be delight. So what you see uh, is that uh, the, 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 the big beverage industry is advertising its beverages as something which can go very well along with sports, with a nice life, with outgoing life, with, with young and, and, and slim people. Uh, that is the kind of, of thing. Uh, in that respect, of course, the advertising methods are a little bit similar to the tobacco industry. I would even say that the tobacco industry learned a lot from the sugar industry. So as we come to the end of this podcast, um, I want to ask about how your work fits into a wave of new scholarship 
uh, that has appeared on commodities. And in the past uh, few decades, and especially in the past few years, we've seen numerous works on different commodities, whether it's cotton, uh, Sven Beckert's work, uh, opium, salt, um, and as we were actually discussing the other day, even something like guano. Um, so what uh, is it about sugar uh, that really shows us something different about the way that uh, global commodities uh, operate historically and also in you know, the, the current economic environment? Well, there are a couple of, to begin with, there are a couple of similarities. I think sugar makes us like cotton or uh, tobacco or coffee uh, or soy and um, palm oil, aware of how different parts of the world are connected and that uh, the soap we use uh, requires some palm oil which can be produced thousands of miles away under conditions which are not ecologically and socially responsible or sustainable. So that's, I think, a very important uh, way to, to see commodities. They are really embodying uh, and, and making visible the global connections about global historians talk so much these days, or all, not only hist global historians, but, but all of us. We all talk about the globalization, about the global connections, that we're all connected to each other. If there's a war in, in Ukraine, half the world is suffering from shortages of wheat. So this is how we are connected to each other. So this, I think, is, is a similarity. Um, now, with respect to what makes sugar special, I think there is the role of, of slavery. I think two-thirds of all uh, kidnapped Africans ended up at the uh, sugar plantations in the Americas. I think that's, that's very special. Of course, there is a similarity also with cotton here. But I think the, 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 this gruesome history of sugar plantations makes sugar stand out in a way in world history. Um, then, uh, finally, I think... To reiterate what I said in the beginning, um, 130 countries in the world uh, produce sugar. There's a heavy competition of sugar in the world. It has severe and serious consequences for our health. Obesity and diabetes too are serious health problems in the, in the coming years. It's a, a pandemic, uh, according to the World Health Organization, an issue which we seriously have to address. Um, sugar... Uh, has in common with um, with uh, soy and a couple of other big commodities like palm oil, that's a so-called flex crop. So cane, for example, can also be used to make alcohol. So that's what you see in Brazil and also in India, that uh, ethanol production is, is, uh, is also uh, joined to, uh, to cane uh, growing. Um, what we see now today is also the, 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 the serious environmental consequences of uh, sugar uh, production of cane uh, cultivation in Brazil, for example, uh, the, the burning of the, the cane field just before the harvesting, which is now forbidden, by the way, in, in many parts of Brazil. The dehydration in West India, uh, which we see today. Um, so this is something which we um, have to face today and that makes the cane sugar and also the beet sugar kind of well, eternal crop that is with us for over uh, seven eight hundred years as a global crop um, and has been so influential in in our uh, economic uh, life but also in our own personal life uh, well, I think that makes sugar something very special. And what I experienced during my talks, I already had a couple of talks, is that everyone in the audience has its, his or her own relationship with sugar. Everyone has questions about sugar. And I, I tried to answer a couple of these questions in my book. The last thing I want to ask you is you, you've now uh, published uh, this, this book based on what seems like, I think, 20 years of, of, of research in sugar, correct? What yeah. uh, what's what's next for you? What what future projects do you have in mind? Well, in general, I would like to emphasize that uh, when we talk about the early industrial age, we always talk about well industrialization in in England and how how this changed the world. Uh, there would not be any change in the world if not the global South had been able to produce so much and so many commodities uh, for the global market. So that varies from tea to opium to uh, cereals, to coffee, um, and of course, uh, sugar. Uh, 
Uh, so I, I want to put uh, our gaze and to ask our attention for all these millions of people in, in the countrysides uh, across the globe who produce the goods uh, for our uh, modern world. Ulve, thank you very much for speaking with us today. This, this is a book which I think is of a special rev- relevance in, in societies like India, where sugar is everywhere. I mean, just outside where I'm recording, at least you can get extremely sugary tea, you can get very sugary sweets, uh, sugars infused in so many aspects of, of local cuisines in places like, like Mumbai. Uh, and it's a really important book, I think, especially as you mentioned, for, for study of the global south as well. So I really want to thank you for, for talking with us today and um, for taking the time out of your schedule in order to share a little bit more about your research on sugar. Thank you. Thank you. You were listening to Past Imperfect, a special podcast series by SPGIMR. Brought to you by SPGIMR's Center for Wisdom and Leadership. Produced by Vinita Vivedi.